Nerds Out of Water is a podcast brought to you by two tech professionals and long-term friends, Michael Lobb and myself, David Camus. We have both worked in many technical careers and have switched to running and owning our own businesses, taking them out of our little fish ponds and putting those businesses into an ocean of sharks. Michael runs TeamScale, whose mission it is to reduce the risk in software development projects. He allows visionary founders and talented developers to deliver amazing software on time and on budget. And thanks, David. Uh, David runs One Bright Cloud, who has a view towards a future where AI is commonplace and autonomous vehicles provide transportation to your location with the smallest energy footprint. From time to time, we'll be joined by guests ranging from business owners to technologists and every role in between. We challenge our own perspectives and we try to see things from each other's perspective. You don't always need to agree, we don't, but after listening to this podcast, you'll definitely have an idea. And just before we go on, this episode was brought to you by Reto to Hope. Say no to drugs, no to alcohol, and if you have a problem, Reto to Hope is Australia offering of free drug and alcohol rehabilitation. Call 0421 949 948. That's Reto to Hope on 0421 949 948. David, our guest today is someone who I've interviewed before um, in the first season of uh, Nerds Out of Water. Um, Anthony Bowers is a BPO professional um, who specialises in providing HR and business process outsourcing to Australia and the rest of the world. He's built a dozens of high-performing teams around the Philippines for clients around the, around the globe, and he's extremely adept at working across cultural teams and loves to get the most out of people. When, we, when I first interviewed Anthony, it was um, – it was in a situation where the world was normal and then we had 2020 and uh, remote working became a lot more popular and a lot more accepted. Um, we're talking to Anthony today to catch up on what's been happening. Um, welcome to Anthony Bowers. You're listening to Nerds Out of Water with Michael Love and David Kemis. Hi, Anthony. Um, it's been uh, a year or so since we spoke last time, and I just wanted to uh, welcome you back to our podcast. You've uh, you've been stuck in Sydney over the last year or so. Yes, I have. Like most Sydney siders, um, you know, we've been stuck. There are different levels of stuckness, if, that, if that's a <laughs> word. Um, so I, I I had the pleasure of being stuck in one of the zones. I was mm. I was a southie in the south zone in in. Um, Dy, and mm. uh, it was really interesting to see the tri tribalism. So you had the southies and the northies, and we were split by the Narrabeen Bridge. North and south, <laughs> north the and river. south. It was um, it was almost Shakespearean. <laughs> two two different houses separated by a bridge. And, <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> but, sorry, I don't I want to ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, look, it was um, it, it's it's fascinating. I mean, it's just it was one of those crazy. Years. I mean, we, I, this is one for the record books for sure. And, mm. uh, you know, I've, I think everyone's seen the memes of history teachers trying to teach 2020 and 2040. I think it'll be a fascinating mm. year to look back on. I, I don't think there's yeah. any other way to put it. So I, I have been in Sydney um, and doing my best to try and reconnect with this, uh, with this city and this country because I've been away for so long. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. And now we're starting to see COVID babies appearing at the hospitals. That's that's the babies born during COVID. Amazing, right? <laughs> Amazing. Yes. And I think we might see a bit of a bump there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's what I no, mean. We are seeing a bump. No double entendre intended. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, and it, it, it's. I was talking about this the other day with um, my, my favourite coffee shop across the road, uh, Twist. Um, and, you know, we were just talking about what effect this will have on 
on on people. And my sort of take on it is that 2021 will be when we finally sort things out gradually and slowly. Mm. Eventually, the vaccine will roll out and life will get back to normal. But I think 2022 is just going to be a wild year. I think 2022 is oh, yeah. is when people break free. And 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 I think we're we're very basic creatures when you when you peel away the onions of everything that humans are basic creatures at the end of the day. And uh, if you if you coop someone up and you coop a whole world up, there's going to be a, a, a real reaction. So I'm looking forward very much to uh, the tail end of 21 and 2022. I think it's going to be a great time to be alive. How have your team been doing without you? I, I know that when I asked you this question a few weeks ago, you said better. But, um, <laughs> In, in reality, like you, you know, well, you're, you're you're separated by your from your team in in the Philippines, yeah. And I guess a few of your clients as well. Of you know, you've, you're probably not able to visit them as much. How how has that affected them? Yeah, it's um, there are many different um, angles to that. So where do I start? Um, running a a small business uh, is a is a very humbling experience, and I mean that without any sickliness and or tackiness or you know, Simon Sinek click likingness. Um, mm. It's 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 truly humbling. Um, and one of the things that I've realised is that essentially I've created something where I'm not needed. Mm. That's good. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I have great people that run talent, a great people uh, over in in Cebu who. Um, you know, my general manager who runs a very tight ship, who's on really on top of all aspects of the, the business from the finances to the HR to the government um, regulations in the Philippines and, and around the world to that point. So she's quite excellent. I have a fantastic client engagement manager um, who is very, very sharp and, and, you know, follows up with me and keeps me... Um, you know, not on my toes isn't the word, but keeps me on top of everything if I if I slip, um, and I trust them completely. So the business is run by them, um, mm. uh, essentially. So, it, of course, it's been incredibly difficult being separated from them, mm -hmm. right? And separated yeah. from yeah. the business and separated from the staff because you grow attached to your staff. So we mm -hmm. we're a sort of a um, you know we're not a ten thousand seat call center like we're a small specialized BPO and we do grow attached to the staff and it's very low churn that mm. that's been hard so the actual day in day out hard nuts of running the business is well taken care of um mm. both from the staffing level and the client facing level I don't have any problem with that but I have a massive problem with the soft part of it in the mm. in, in in that you know I want to be mm. with my staff I want to be doing um team building activities um and finally it's cobbler's shoes i should be great at it we're a remote staffing company um yeah right uh but it's Very like point. but at the same time i mean what why what we've realized is why clients engage with us is that they want to create a physical community but remotely yeah so it's not like a remote community remotely it's a it's an office that gets switched on mm. overseas. Um, so that, that's that been a tough one. Um, as far as clients go, there are many clients that I've never seen. Mm -hmm. So so that's not such an issue. But then there are other clients that I love spending time with that I haven't been able to um, because of COVID. So it's, 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 yeah. it's been a hurly-burly year. Um, so yeah. you've worked some yeah. time, obviously, in Hong Kong and the Philippines. Yeah. How have how do you do you feel that small business over there is actually coping? Not your small business as such, but small business in general. Yeah, you know, I've spent twenty years overseas, so I did ten years wow. in mainland China, and I did ten in Hong Kong, with the, sort of the last seven being a mix of um, of uh, Hong Kong and the Philippines. Um. What I've been impressed about, like, so it was definitely a massive impact, right? We know that because we lost clients in at the beginning of COVID, H a huge impact on, on small businesses. Um, what I've been impressed by 
is the resilience of companies and people. Right? That, that has really impressed me. Um, and I think that is something about, about humans in general um, and, uh, and societies to different extents is that they do find a way to get through things no matter how dire. I was actually listening to a, a, a wonderful podcast called The History of Rome. It was fascinating about the Romans that they just didn't stop. No matter what happened, they just kept going. And mm -hmm. no matter how dire the situation, they just kept going. They were relentless. Um, and I can't say that the, you know, from my experience with the Philippine companies about it being res relentless, but what I sure have seen is that they have found ways to cope no matter what the situation is. So I, so I can give you one example. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is my, my company, um, but it's a great example of how people get through. So I've got a cat operator who works for a company in, um, in Sydney. He was stuck in the middle of nowhere, wherever it was. He wasn't in the office, but he was able to team view into the computer that he uses to do the cat operation from his village, from a mobile, for the data, and was able to keep working while he was out of the office. Mm. Um, cool. With a, a – with a, and, when, and I think he eventually got a LAN connected somehow, <coughs> you know, 10, 15 metre LAN from his computer to a neighbour's house or something. <laughs> you, you, you find a way, right? Yep, you find yeah, a way. Indeed. Um, now, he's, um, he's back in the office now, and that's great. But I, I was just so impressed with that. Um, and mm. the, um, the, and I think that story is replicated across the BPO industry in the Philippines and across all industries um, in Asia and throughout the world is that, is that people have found mm. a way to cope uh, under really difficult circumstances. And that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And I think that resilience of learning to cope and and digressing what your own business is doing mm. um, it is all, it was all around the world. Doesn't yeah. matter whether you're locked at home, locked in a village, or wherever. You you just make it work. It's a great learning. Uh, it totally is. It totally is, and it's it's amazing what you can you, what you can achieve when the chips are down. And that's mm -hmm. what I've learned from that, and and that things can be done even when you think they can't, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you don't know until you actually do it. And that was that was yeah. impressive for me, and, and it also was a sort of a, a for our business because it's it's a very difficult thing to actually say what we do. Mm. And you know, people say, "Do you do software development?" Well, no, mm. we don't do software development, but we provide software developers. Do you do architecture? Mm. No, but we have CAD operators. Um, mm. Do you do accounting? Well, no, but you know, we've hired tons of them for clients. Mm. And mm. what what a, the conclusion I've come to is what we do is HR. And we do mm. it really well. So we do all aspects of the HR well, including the soft stuff. And that's something that really came into focus during this pandemic and, and this problem is that talent was there. When I say talent, I mean my people in Cebu, Evelyn and Mitch mm. and all the others, um, reassuring our staff, motivating them, letting them know that we're there for them, um, making sure that that talent culture was maintained throughout mm -hmm. um, 2020, and there's something very powerful there. So it's a very soft mm. thing, but it's a very powerful thing. And often you can't see it or sometimes not really be able to put a proper value on it except in these difficult circumstances where that really shines mm. through, where the staff wanted to be reassured. They wanted to know they had a backup. They wanted to make um, to, to know that we were there for them. Um, and that the clients were there for them and that we were going to get through this together. I, I thought it was fantastic. I don't think I've been to so many virtual Christmas parties ever. I don't think I've ever been to a virtual Christmas party until this year, and I think yeah. we went to four or five, and mm. that goes to personal life as well. I have virtual dinners now with my family around Australia and the UK, and we we actually enjoy it. Yeah, um, it's really interesting. Well, I had a, a virtual thing with TeamScale. Mm -hmm. um, which was great, and I got I got I got yes. told to uh, get lost by the um, the transvestite that was doing the show because she thought I was recording her. 
when in fact I was just on a video call with uh, Mike's team, <laughs> but I just happened to be at this pub where there was a there was a show going. Oh, on. That makes more sense. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that would. Yeah, without the last qualifying part, the first part would have been very weird. But that was my first sort of virtual Christmas dinner. Um, <laughs> so it was. It was uh, wow. Um, At one point, I did think you were talking about Michael, then. But anyway. No, no, no. But um, it's um. It, it was an experience, and again, I think done well, they're great. Yeah. Right. I think. I think you, there are a lot of ways that you can make remote Christmas parties and remote. Anything work really well, but you have to work at it, like anything. Yeah. And you, you've you been doing a lot of town halls and things with your team as well, I guess. Yeah, so. well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we get together and they, like I said, like like, like me, they're not, they're not super focused or regimented, but mm-hmm. we just get on, we have a chat, have a laugh. Yeah. You know, how's are there any other tools great, that you've found? Is- are there other, any other tools that you've found to be helpful during – you know, remote working that you've that you've picked up on. Look, no, just the normal stuff, uh, but a lot more of it. So things mm. like, um, you know, hangouts we're using a lot, and, you know, the screen sharing, et cetera, et cetera, that that we may not have used before very mm. much, but we do now. Um, so they've just become far more front and centre. What we've just what I've noticed mainly is a change um, in attitude towards these tools rather than the tools themselves. So, for example, um, you know, with Zoom or, or, or whatever, I would have been mortified if someone knew that I was at home. Mm. So I'm mortified. I just, I just, I remember really early on my son had walked past the camera when I was on a call and I just, I just <laughs> wanted, wanted to melt, right? Wanted to melt. And now I'm like, yeah, no, this is just how it is. Yeah, I'm at home. My son's here. My family's here. You know, the cat's gonna jump around. You know, what? It's it's what it is, um, mm. and I, I've liked that. That's refreshing. Um, you know, I've liked that um, remote work, and this is from a purely selfish business point of view. That remote work is is no longer um, on the exterior. Mm. It's very much front and center. Uh, and who'd have thunk? Who'd have thunk that uh, the, the digital transformation um, in 2020 would be driven by COVID. You know, a, mm. vi- a virus has uh, has yep. driven digital transformation in companies. And people all over the world have realised, oh, it's not so not so hard after all. Correct. That's right. Correct. I, I've not said, we work with a lot of large government organisations and I, I am surprised at how many security people had to really work out how to allow Zoom and all of the other video capabilities to go through firewalls because nearly all governments in Australia didn't have the permission of external video conferencing. Yes. So it's a simple, oh, mm. my God, what do we have to do to remove ports to, to allow yeah. port usage? Mm. Yeah, exactly. And it, was, and it was interesting to see how Zoom itself had to change its security requirements because yeah, of yeah, yeah. naughty school children. Um, <laughs> deciding to do funny things on cameras, et cetera, uh, um, when they shouldn't. But, a, a, again, it's it's uh, it's just been one of those years where, where technology, it's been there, but suddenly it's become front and centre. Um, mm. and, and mental health as well. I mean, without it, oh, there'd yeah. be people who were not, not able to communicate with other people. So I think that that's helped in keeping people alive in some respects because they've had – They've had that facility to be able to talk to people, whereas, you know, if this was in the eighties or the or earlier, we wouldn't have had that. Completely, completely. I I, I think mental health and isolation, et cetera, is is a dire um, issue and a real problem around mm-hmm. COVID and and Zoom and Hangouts and whatever you're using for your communication is a great tool to help c- keep that um, sense of community. And whether that's your business community or a community yeah, where personal, where you live yeah. or whatever it is, it's really really important. Mm. And as always, when we talk about mental health, let's also provide the Beyond Blue capabilities and who we support. So Beyond Blue, their phone number is one three hundred two two four six three six. That's one three hundred two two four six three six. And don't ever be afraid to give them a call, whatever you're feeling. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Mental, mental health is something that we need to um, be able to have open and honest discussions about, and without the stigma. 
That's right. Agreed. Agreed. So with regard in relation to remote staffing, you're yep. highly experienced in that. Have you noticed any increase, decrease on Western Reliance on it? That's a really interesting um that's a really interesting question. It it ebbs and flows and it's ebbs and ebbed and flowed forever since it started. Now remote um working, offshoring, rather than outsourcing, if we're gonna get technical about it. So outsourcing's been done since bookmakers have made books and sent off the mm -hmm. glue glue to the gluers. That's outsourcing. Um offshoring in the Philippines, you know, has a start date. I, I think it's uh nineteen ninety two, I think, if I mm -hmm. if I remember rightly, with Accenture Accenture in Makati. Um and that's where it began. Um, so I think I think that was time zero. Correct me if I'm wrong and, and send me emails and and whatever, but I, I, I think I'm correct in saying that date and uh, the people. Um, and it's gone through different iterations, David. So you had the sort of the very early adopters sort of exploring and, you know, what is this light bulb electricity thing? What is it? How do we use it mm. and stuff? It then got, um, I think, unfortunately picked up on by CFOs around the world. And they were like, great, we're going to get rid of everyone and we're going to put them all in the Philippines. We're going to put them all in India and it'll be perfect. It'll be wonderful. And of course, it was a disaster, right? Um, if you only if you only look at cost, um, when you're looking at offshoring, then you are bound to fail. Mm -hmm. um, I think the latest iteration is a much more sensible one, and that goes to this ebbing and flowing, where businesses know that they can't um, remove all of their local staff, and it's a really silly thing to do. But at the same time, they can be looking at offshoring as a way of augmenting their staff numbers and allowing them to compete. So I'm very comfortable with what we do because I think that Australian businesses who use offshoring um, allow themselves to be competitive against international forces. And right? that's mm. very important. Um, now, as far as like this year, there's there has been some businesses pulling back. So there's a couple of the contact centres have moved back, and that was because um, their contact centres were uh, shut down overnight, literally overnight. Mm -hmm. So, so their yes. operation—I I won't name names, but you know, their operations managers are getting calls at three AM saying we have no support; it, it doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore, right? And I think that's a wake-up call um, regarding over reliance. You know, I, 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 and and I just think that's a across whatever we're talking about. I think any business that is solely reliant on one source of supply that's a business critical mm -hmm. thing. I, I think I think that's a mistake. I think you have to have different sources. Um, where if we talk and if we're talking about HR, that means having some of your team in Australia, some overseas. Um, that would be. I think it's a sensible way of looking at it, uh, and the correct way of doing it. And it and it works beautifully. And I love seeing it. Mm -hmm. I love seeing the teams working together. I love seeing our teams feel that they're part of the um, local company, uh, part of their culture, uh, and we provide the mechanism to make that happen. And great things happen um, mm. when businesses mm. have take that attitude and invest time in it. Do you do you think that it's helped um, the way that people accept outsourcing? It's a, that, that's a, another really fascinating one. We're, we're getting onto some real touch points here. So um, you know, I often say that uh, I mean, there's some fairly strong opinions um, about uh, what we do. I think that broadly, an acceptance of remote working will lead to an acceptance of offshoring. Mm -hmm. And I and I think, or what I know um, in my years of doing offshoring are the deep bonds that form between onshore and offshore teams if it's done right. Now, now, if it's done where we're going to get rid of all of the local staff and it's all going overseas, then there is no bond. There is just an ugliness, right? Why wouldn't there be? If you're there mm -hmm. trying to train up the person that's taking your job, that is a very unpleasant thing. If you're there training the person that is going to augment your role, so mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the large software developer and teams that mm. we've rolled we've rolled out that were enormously successful, right? Where you've had someone that is say a mid a mid level programmer that's moving into a team lead position. 
suddenly they've got 10 to 15 people under them. That mm-hmm. is a opportunity that is very rare um, in Australia or America or wherever it is for a, for a local team, but is but is very doable um, uh, when you're using an offshore team. And so that really raises the game of the of the local staff and gives them great opportunities. It helps the companies um, be able to increase their productivity while while maintaining control of the bottom line. Um, and it's a win all round. It keeps it competitive. Um, so and and circling back to the point, I think that once people have um, used offshore teams, mm-hmm. once they have formed bonds with their staff, one, and once they've realised that that staff member is there to help that company grow and strengthens their position, then there is acceptance. Mm. Uh, I think it was Mark Twain that said, uh, "Travel, what is it? Travel is a great cure for prejudice." Mm. Um, and and um, and you know, here I'd say actually having an offshore staff member, an offshore team member, is a great cure of prejudice of that. Mm. Um, and especially in the latest iteration of of offshoring, where companies yeah. realise that they will be keeping their staff, that their local staff have immense value, a lot of it in the heads, um, that should be you know, and that and it goes to what is a great thing of offshoring, in in that a lot of the companies talk to don't have procedures written down, don't have run books, don't have things um, ordered, and mm. offshoring forces that to happen. Mm-hmm. You have to have everything um, codified for it to work properly, and it's a beautiful thing. Mm. You, you were talking, I mean, and that, that leads into another question that I've got about how far down the line do you think we are on the BPO to KPO road where, you know, your BPO is more about process orientation and and uh, driving, you know, workflow, whereas your KPOs, your knowledge processes are like more about making decisions and making, you know, making uh, creative decisions on, on how things are progressing. Yeah. Um, where to start on that one? Um, the BPO industry exists because of technology, right? It's mm-hmm. simple as that. As uh, software has moved into the cloud, you know, so your server is no longer under the stairs, probably a good thing, right? Because, you know, don't tell me your security is better than, you know, Microsoft or whatever, whoever's mm-hmm. doing it. Um but as it's moved into the cloud, so the chains of location have broken down. So we know we're, we're no longer chained to a location regarding where things are done, mm. right? And if that's the case, then we can look globally for our HR and should. I've always thought it's an absolute nonsense that businesses are told that they must compete in the international market. So that's the mantra mm-hmm. that we're told. You need to compete. You have to compete. You know, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, if it's from India, China, whatever, you must compete. And then when a business tries to be competitive by using offshoring, it's, oh, that's wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, no, hang on. Well, what is it? We either we either are totally closed or we're open. This in-between one is a very hard thing to do. So, sorry, I digress. Um, that's okay. Back, back to it. Um, so, the technology has allowed the BPO industry to exist, and so it will be the cause of its downfall right and i don't mean that as a as a as a bad thing but as um a, 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 the downfall of a certain type of work that is done in the bpo industry so that cookie cutter data collection data copying data scraping uh data management i think will all be done by computers and ai in about 15 to 20 years it's already starting you think and that I th- long i do i do for it to be complete so it's already starting. Oh, okay. It's already starting, uh, but it'll be commonplace uh, in 10, 15, 20 years. It'll just, it's, it, it just, that role will not exist anymore. Um, mm. I think the robotic voice uh, operations that we see out of Google won't um, fly. I just, I just think it's, it's, there's this uncanny valley weirdness about talking to a computer that sounds like a human that, that won't be accepted. But that's my personal opinion. So I think there'll still be voice work. I could be wrong, but I, I would not like to have a conversation with a computer um, that sounds like a human. I just There's just something that 
strikes me as just odd about that. Mm. Could could just be me. I, and I could be completely wrong. It'd be interesting to see where that goes. Um, but the BPO industry as it is now will be obliterated by technology. So then what what's left and what it is is KPO. Right? And again it's that mm. it's that it's that transition um, and that familiarity. So people have used offshore staff. They've realized what's capable and well, and the and they've realized sorry the capability that's out there and those people will move up the chain so they're no longer just doing data entry they're doing data analysis they're no longer just doing um you know accounting recording they're doing investigation work or uh consultative work on that accounting so the nature of the role um invariably will will move to kpo both through mm. the um the historical relationships between the client and the staff member, um, the maturing of the idea of what can be achieved. So that not the maturing of the staff. The staff are already mature and capable. It's the maturing of the the client countries and the client businesses to understand what is what is capable out there. Mm-hmm. Um, that, the, that there are people, um, and of course there are, that can come in and, and run your IT department. Right? We've hired people that that would very easily slot into any CTO role in the Fortune mm. 500 companies with, with ease. Uh, and that's just a matter of people getting used to that. So, yes, KPO is the future. BPO will no longer exist as it is now. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but there will still be room for um, hiring people remotely, but the roles will be vastly different. And I think that that will sort of align um, with changes of work everywhere in the world. So what work will be left? If everything robotic is done, well, what is there? Well, then it's creative stuff. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's, it's the creative industries, et cetera, that are going to thrive um, in the future. And, and I don't see there's any reason why that can't be done in an offshore model. So I'm very yeah. confident. I think I agree fully with your voice statement about mm. uh, speaking yeah. to computers in its current form. It's I creepy. don't believe it will carry on. Um, but I think it will have to evolve and will evolve to a point where we may not even be able to identify it. But I think that's quite a way down the track. Uh, and and then we get into regulatory um, yes. um, things. You know, Is it right to continue things? Now, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, but I remember what was the... What was the Facebook program that they shut down for the AI? Was it Facebook? Google? Oh, where they developed their own language. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, oh, nothing to see here, folks. It's all mm. good. We're just going to shut the whole thing down. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, okay. That's, I, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, so I think there are areas of where that can we do it? Yes. Should we do it? Well, we need to really seriously consider it. If, if you think about computers and robotics mimicking your voice. We use voice recognition on a number of government websites now. If you now have a computer mimicking you, there's a problem. Mm. You, you bet. And also <laughs> deep, deep fake videos. I mean, that's terrifying. No, oh, yeah, that's right. Mm. right um, it's, ter- it's terrifying, but it's also, you know, hey, the last episode of The Mandalorian had a great uh, spoiler alert in it. Yeah. Mm, okay. With using deepfake, am I allowed to say it? Because I because I don't want to spoil it for anyone that hasn't seen it. Uh, I've said the spoiler alert thing. Spoiler, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler. Are we talking about loot, loot coming in. Yeah, yeah, man. Of course, <gasps> like like wow. it was great. It was fantastic. Um, it was absolutely fantastic, and I loved that. And uh, and I liked I liked that yeah. better than I liked the Rogue One uh, CG version of uh, Tarkin and Princess Leia. Me too. Me too. They didn't quite hit it. So Luke, Luke, Luke's um, deep fake thing hit the spot for me as well. Although, mm. funny enough, I'm going to come out here and say something controversial. My favourite Star Wars is Rogue One. There we go. I've said it. Yeah. No, no I'm, I'm with mm. you on that. Empire I've Strikes Back it. and Rogue One are great yeah. for me. Yeah, come uh, out, Empire Strikes it. Back. It's got to yeah. be the best one. Mm. Although, I kind of thought, I felt a little bit for the people in Holland because Darth Vader means Dark Father in Dutch, so mm. they kind of knew, and I, I've always felt for them in a sort of way. But <laughs> I, I digress. 
We shouldn't go down the okay. Star Wars rabbit hole because then that's all we'll talk no, about we, for five we hours. We could be on here for five hours, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, mm. Now, I am a tre- I'm, I'm the treasurer of SCAL, which is the a premier travel agency group. You mentioned travelling um, a little while ago in one of our questions. Can I ask you when you think we're going to be able to travel again? <sighs> yeah. We're <laughs> I mean, talking to our lawyers in the Philippines about it. <laughs> Just just the other day, because it's like, when can we get back? Um, I would say August of this year is when it's going to be Ooh, easy August to travel. August 2021. August 2021, I think, is when it's going to become easier to travel. Um, but it's it's um it's quite incredible. Have you checked the pricing for, to get to Hong Kong? Yeah. I'm not Hong Kong, but I have other places. It's like it's insane. I'll sell everything I've got, and I'll still have the shirt on me back for the for the trip. You know, it's maybe. No, you're lucky. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> so I I mean that there's you know the ability to travel, and then there's doesn't make sense. And it's an interesting one because we used to fly around all the time, and it's like, well, maybe we have to think about that about whether it's necessary to actually physically go there again. It, it's cobbler's shoes. I right? I should be the one saying who needs to fly. You know, it's nonsense. You can do everything remotely, you um, can. and you can. Um, apart from the soft, uh, apart from the soft and touchy feely stuff, the touchy yeah, and, feely soft stuff, yeah. And Anthony, sure. you know, you know, like you know, when we had our team there in the Philippines, that you know, having face to face time is really important. I think, and even even this year with, with the team in Vietnam, not being able to visit them has been, you know, we 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 miscommunicate sometimes, and that's that's a problem. Whereas yep. you know, prior to that, when we when I was traveling three or four times a year, you'd you'd build that relationship up and you'd get to know each other's little little foibles and you'd understand what people were talking about when they s- said specific things. So, you know, you, you get used to the way that they communicate. Humans are funny creatures, mm. right? We're very, we're very simple creatures at the end of the day. We crave connection mm-hmm. and part of that is that physical connection. And again, it goes back to the ma- maturing of the industry and the maturing of how how we understand that things work. Because remember, this has only been going on for 30 years, mm. offshoring and, and in offshoring via countries. It's still very young, still mm. very young. I think what we've come to understand is that you do need that mix. You do need that physical presence um, mm. when you can when you can go and visit your team, do so, uh, and but also utilise the fact that they are remote um, where you can. So it's it's not... 100% remote, it's not 100% physical, it's a mix, and that balance um, needs to be worked out between client and team. Anthony, if you could change something February 2020, so just prior to the pandemic coming through and being big news, what would you change? I don't, I don't want to talk about regrets or looking back. I mean, we lost a really major client in February 2020, right? and I didn't see it coming. Uh, it it oh, came due out to COVID. Due to wow. COVID, right? And uh, I mean, I thought I had my bases covered, etc. Um, if I could do something again, it'd be having a far more thorough forensic in uh, my client's exposure to COVID. And I didn't mm. see it. I didn't see it for this particular client, who was our biggest client, and we lost that person. Um, mm. um, and that if, if, if I would have done anything different, it would have been to pay far more attention to that possibility. Um, and I think that's a mistake that a lot of small business owners make um, in not potentially being aware of uh, hidden threats mm-hmm. um, that are out there. So that would have been my, the thing that I would have concentrated far more on because it was a massive shock to the system. But I think that's the same with small, medium and large business, you know, yeah. one bright cloud. We looked at this situation and now we look back res- retrospectively. Mm. We didn't think we had all of our eggs in one basket. We yeah. had travel industry, we had private business and we had government industry. Yeah. And we lost major contracts right across the board. So I think we're all in the very similar position to what you just said and we're looking mm. back to going, how could we have resolved that? How, how could we expose or or hide the exposure on that sort of – mitigate the exposure on that sort of issue. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a tough one because it, it, you have conflicting needs uh, mm-hmm. and those needs need, need to be resolved. And we, I just couldn't put the rope together for this client. Um, 
you know, I didn't see that his business would be so badly affected. I didn't yeah. see um, that he, uh, you know, he would not allow people doing remote work from home, right? And there was no, oh. there was no um, budging. I didn't, didn't even think that that would be an issue. What mm -hmm. didn't I? But I didn't ask. So I was there. I was there blithely going along, thinking that things were a certain way, and they're actually a completely different way. And I only found out when it was way too late. Yeah. And uh, that was a that was a huge mistake, a learning curve. Well, uh, one more question from me, yeah. if I may. Sure. You've just mentioned one thing that you would look back on and change. Is there anything else you would have changed um, about how your team handled the pandemic during the pandemic time? Well, I can't. I can't fault them actually i mean i'm trying to think of something that i'd like them to do differently but uh I, the team great answer i thought were were brilliant um th through enormous problems so we've had team members lose family members all that sort of stuff but i think i think it was a combined effort between talent uh our staff at talent when i say talent talent executives uh the talent staff and the clients all very much collaborating to make things work and just getting things done. So that's, that's a really good on your team. Mm. Yeah. Great. Answer. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not being supercilious no. or whatever the word is. I, if I could think of something, I would, but I, I can't fault them. You said at the beginning that, you know, the, that they run the company and it's yep. run well. So that's good. Yeah. Um, Anthony, the last, last one for me, I've, we've done a few webinars lately and obviously webinars have become the new, um, the new norm in terms of, you know, being able to reach out to people and network and talk yep. about things. You're a huge proponent of the fireside format where you're just having a chat rather than pre-prepared questions and things like yep. that. What do you think it is about that that makes it so much, well, for me, so much easier to listen to and make, you know, a, give, I think it's a lot more informative as well because it goes mm. to different places. It, it It's the unguarded nature of it, right, um, that is critical. It's the unguarded moments. Was that a song? In an unguarded, unguarded moment. moment. Yeah, who was that? I'll just leave you to yeah, go sorry. for it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I think it was the church. I tried to, it was the church. You're right. Yeah. It was the church. Wow. Goodness me. So that's a throwback to the 80s. But it, it, it is the unguarded moments that are the, the most brilliant. It's the unexpected pleasure that we never saw coming that is the most pleasurable. Mm -hmm. Um. And I'm, again, a music thing. I remember reading this article about a young music editor that was forced to go and listen to uh, Jefferson Airplane mm -hmm. or whatever they were called at that stage. I think it was just called. There was became Star Jefferson Starship, Starship and then it was Starship, yeah. and it was at an Indian reservation casino. And she and she was a young reporter. And she was forced to go to it. And she just thought it would be the worst thing that ever happened to her. And in retrospect, it was the highlight of her life. It was the most brilliant thing that she's ever seen. And it was the unexpected pleasure. And I find that the fireside format gives that. Mm. We don't really know where it's going. Sometimes, you know, things come out where I might ask you to edit like I did before. <laughs> <laughs> where it's a bit too much. But on the whole, you know, I just think it provides a far more uh, informative format, a uh, far more interesting thing for listeners and for the uh Interviewers, you know, you don't mm. really know where it's going, and and you just see what comes out of it. Of course, you have to pick your um, speak as well. You know, I think yeah, the panel that we did the other day was excellent because we had great people on it. Mm. You know, right. they, they were they were uh, there was some really really fascinating stuff that came out of it, um, and, and yeah, knowledge, knowledge it was great all around. Well. Totally, totally. So, in line with that. Uh, fireside format we are going to wrap up um thanks anthony okay. for sp taking the time to talk to us and making uh your time available thank you very much for coming back on it's an absolute pleasure to be here after the the crazy year we've had and let's see how things are in 2022 do yeah. it again in a year's time okay <laughs> sounds <laughs> it's good it's a deal bye see you anthony